Hello everyone, and welcome to the wonderful recap of Oz. My name is Justin Peavy, and I will be reading through L. Frank Baum's novels and diving into a few of the countless film, television, stage, and literary adaptations taking place in the magical land of Oz. Welcome to episode 6. Today we're discussing The Emerald City of Oz, which is the sixth book L. Frank Baum wrote for this series, and we have several returning characters and even a returning villain, which will make this episode all the more exciting. There isn't much to say about this book. It was published in 1910, and it's dedicated to Baum's niece Cynthia, who was born the year before. John R. Neal uses more watercolor illustrations, which he previously utilized in book 4, Dorothy and the Wizard in Oz. In the author's note, Baum acknowledges the fans who contributed ideas that he used in this book, as always, and thanks them for their creative partnership with him. I would like to apologize in advance for the back-and-forth structure of this summary. This book isn't as linear as its predecessors, and it has multiple plot lines, so please bear with me as I relay the events in the book as they happen. Now, I present to you my personal summary of The Emerald City of Oz. The Gnome King is very angry. He calls his chief counselor to the throne room and announces to him that he's very distressed over the loss of his magic belt. He suggests that the Gnome King try not wanting to do magical things, and then he can't be angry that the belt's gone. This infuriates the Gnome King, who calls for his guards to take the chief counselor and throw him away. He then calls for the chief steward, Coleco, and continues to complain about Dorothy and Ozma. He throws a tantrum because he's lost all of his magic abilities, so Coleco mentions that the Gnome King would have to go to the land of Oz to recover it. This is a seemingly impossible task because of the deadly desert surrounding the land of Oz, but Coleco tries to comfort him by saying he still maintains his power over his large Gnome Kingdom. The King throws a fit again, frightening Coleco away. The King calls for the general of his armies, named Blug. He orders General Blug to march his army to the land of Oz, destroy the Emerald City, and recover the magic belt. The general reiterates that they can't cross the deadly desert, and that Ozma has powers that would render the army helpless. But he does suggest two ways to get to the land of Oz. They could go over the desert, or under the desert. This idea delights the Gnome King, who plans to have his subjects dig a tunnel that travels under the desert and reaches the Emerald City. The general is still hesitant about how well the army will shape up against Ozma's powers, and recommends that the king give up on the idea entirely. The Gnome King throws his scepter at General Blug, which hits him on the head and knocks him unconscious. Meanwhile, in Kansas, Uncle Henry is struggling financially. With the expenses of rebuilding the farmhouse after the cyclone, as well as traveling to Australia and California, Henry has found that he can't pay the mortgage on his new farm. The deadline is quickly approaching, so when Dorothy finds Aunt Em crying one morning, she asks what's wrong. They reveal to their niece that they must give up the farm and start a new life, and they also express their concerns they won't be able to care for Dorothy if they're impoverished. Dorothy smiles, thinking it's silly that she'd have to do housework for a living in Kansas when she's a princess in Oz. Here we learn that Dorothy has told her stories about her journeys to Oz to her aunt and uncle, who of course are quite skeptical about these adventures. When she mentions that Ozma has begged Dorothy to live in the Emerald City permanently, Uncle Henry and Aunt Em share an amazed look. Likely in his desperation, Henry asks Dorothy if she could return to Oz and live in the Emerald City, with Em believing she'd be better off in a fairy land. Again, they remain skeptical, and Dorothy laughs at this. She has already come up with a plan to help her aunt and uncle and assures them that she will go to Oz that afternoon when Ozma looks into her magic picture at 4 o'clock. Dorothy grabs Toto and goes to her room in the attic and sits in a chair until the time comes. Henry and Em wait at the bottom of the stairs, knowing full well that there is no other way out of the farmhouse from the attic. At four o'clock, Dorothy doesn't return. They wait another half hour before going to the attic to check on their niece, only to find that she has disappeared. By this time, Dorothy has arrived at the Emerald City and greets Ozma lovingly. Dorothy tells Ozma of her aunt and uncle's troubles in Kansas, explaining that they can't pay the mortgage and are too old to find other work that could sustain them. 
So, she wonders if Ozma will allow Dorothy, Uncle Henry, and Aunt Em to live on a small farm in Oz together. Ozma is more than happy to grant Dorothy's requests, as she's had a similar idea in the past. Dorothy is concerned that she'll have to give up her title as princess when she lives on a farm in Oz, but Ozma interrupts, stating that her family won't have to live on a farm. They can live in the palace, where they'll never have to work again. Ozma decides to summon them to Oz using the magic belt the next day. Back in the Gnome King's palace, King Roquat the Red plans how he will conquer the Emerald City and enslave its people. After summoning his army to a grand cavern, he finds that Chief Steward Coleco, General Blug, and Colonel Crinkle refuse to comply with the king's plans, out of fear that they will be unsuccessful. The king has Blug thrown away, and Crinkle sent to the torture chamber, where he is sliced and fed to the seven-headed dogs. The Gnome King asks for a volunteer to lead the uprising, and a man named Guff comes forward. He announces that he hates people that are good, happy, contented, and prosperous. Since the Ozites fill all of these criteria, he will happily assume the role of general of the Gnome army. The king does warn him, however, that if he's unsuccessful, he will be destroyed. General Guff and the Gnome King convene in a private cave and discuss an attack plan. Guff is not afraid of the king, and asserts his dominance by blowing smoke from the king's own pipe at his face. Guff explains that it'll be difficult to overthrow a land with so many sorcerers, so he decides to call in some favors from other evil creatures in the countries surrounding Oz. The king is elated to hear this idea, and Guff plans to leave that afternoon to visit the chief of the Whimsies. Upon Dorothy's return, the people of Oz are eager to see her again. She and Toto are visited by the wizard, Belina, TikTok, Jack Pumpkinhead, the Cowardly Lion, the Hungry Tiger, Professor Wogglebug, and the Shaggy Man, who Ozma has appointed the governor of the royal storehouses. At the end of the day, she retires to the four rooms in the palace that have been given to her by Ozma. The next morning, Dorothy dresses in a fine silk gown and a coronet, and she meets Ozma in her bedroom for breakfast. Dorothy's concerned that her aunt and uncle, being unfamiliar with the lives of distinguished people, will struggle to adjust in Oz. But Ozma is still determined to use the magic belt to teleport Uncle Henry and Aunt Em to the Emerald City, knowing that they will not miss the old life they have in Kansas. Ozma and Dorothy make their way to the throne room where Ozma puts on the magic belt. There is a large crowd of guests in the room waiting for Dorothy's relative's arrival. Suddenly, Uncle Henry and Aunt Em appear in the center of the room. They're frozen in fear, startled by their sudden change in surroundings. In fact, it was so sudden that Henry is still wearing his work clothes and Em, who is in the middle of doing dishes, is carrying a dish towel and a plate in her hands. They're bewildered, looking around the room before finally setting their eyes on Dorothy. They all embrace, and Dorothy ensures them that they have safely arrived in the land of Oz, where they can live for the rest of their days and be happy. She also introduces them to her friend, Princess Ozma, who gives them a warm welcome and presents them to the Ozites as their newest citizens. Dorothy leads Aunt Em and Uncle Henry to the rooms that were prepared for them. Henry and Em are amazed and excited as Dorothy informs them that they'll never have to work again. At the same time, the Gnome King starts working on his tunnel while General Guff travels to visit the Chief of the Whimsies. The Whimsies have large, strong bodies, but heads that are the size of doorknobs. So in their self-consciousness, the Whimsies wear large, ridiculously painted heads made of pasteboard over their normal heads. These creatures are universally feared because of their immortality and strong fighting skills. General Guff appears to the Chief and announces that the Gnomes plan to conquer the Land of Oz and are requesting the Whimsies' help. The chief wants to know what their reward will be, so Guff explains that the Gnome King will use his magic belt to give every whimsy a natural head as large as their false one. This pleases the chief, who calls a meeting with his people. Only one of the whimsies is skeptical, so he is thrown into the river, destroying his pasteboard head. Because of the overwhelmingly positive response, the whimsies are glad to form an alliance with the gnomes. Dorothy gives her aunt and uncle a tour of their new rooms, and they quickly realize how easily they will have access to everything they need. Henry decides to take a bath and dress himself in a blue satin suit. Dorothy brings Aunt Em to see Jellia Jam, who helps dress and groom her. When they reunite, they are astounded by their new looks, Em saying that they are helpless victims of high-toned royalty. Dorothy shows them around the palace while Em and Henry ask questions about their niece's stories, now knowing them to have been true all along. Dorothy brings them to the backyard to visit with Belina. Belina announces that she's lost one of her chicks, and two others have turned out to be Daniel's rather than Dorothy's. But since she's last seen Dorothy, all of her chicks have had chicks, 
and now Bellina has over 400 descendants. However, there is still a lack of creativity involved because all of them are named Dorothy or Daniel. Dorothy decides to play with the chicks while Uncle Henry and Aunt Em explore the palace gardens on their own. While admiring the flowers and shrubs, they turn a corner and come face to face with the lion. Em and Henry begin to scream, and knowing they have no weapon to protect themselves, Em tries to intimidate the lion using a hard stare. The lion visibly becomes uneased by this, so he asks Em what the matter is. The fact that the lion can talk startles the Kansas natives, who then realize this must be the cowardly lion that Dorothy had told them about. He confirms this as true, stating that he was terrified by Em's fierce look in her eyes. The group then comes to the agreement that none of them will harm each other, and they all hope to cross paths again soon. General Guff starts traveling northwest to the country of the Growlywogs. After enduring the perplexing Ripple Land, he is seized by two guards and carried to the Grand Gallipoot of the Growlywogs. They are giant, man-like creatures that are all skin and bone and muscle. According to the author, the weakest Growlywog could pick up an elephant and toss it seven miles away. Once he is placed before the Grand Gallipoot, Guff reveals that he represents the Army of the Gnomes, and he's asking the Growlywogs to assist him in conquering the goody-goody Land of Oz. The Gallipoot demands 20,000 Ozites as a reward, so they may become his slaves, and General Guff agrees to this condition. The Gallipoot orders his guards to carry Guff to his prison, where he is repeatedly stuck with pins by the jailer. While General Guff is imprisoned, the Growlywogs conspire to help conquer Oz, and then conquer the Gnome King by stealing his magic belt and making him their slave. They also call dibs on other prominent Ozites to enslave and intend to keep the secret of their plan until the right time comes. After they convene, they enjoy dinner and free General Guff from his prison, and the Gallipoot announces that he will march with 18,000 of his most powerful warriors alongside the Gnomes and the Whimsies. In the days that follow Uncle Henry and Aunt Em's arrival in Oz, they struggle to adjust their new lifestyle, mainly because there is no work for them to do. Dorothy discusses this with Ozma, who decides to find some tasks to keep them occupied with. In the meantime, she suggests that Dorothy take a trip with them through Oz until Ozma can come up with some ideas. Ozma herself plans out the trip, which is set to begin the next morning. Before they leave, Dorothy is given a letter of introduction that is signed by Ozma. Accompanying them on their trip is the Wizard, the Shaggy Man, Belina, and Ombi Ambi, the Captain General of Ozma's army. The red wagon they ride in is carried by the Sawhorse, and, as they leave the Emerald City, they are cheered on by the citizens of Oz. Dorothy has the Sawhorse go straight to Quadling Country, for their first stop is visiting Miss Cuttenclip and her people. They travel leisurely on their way, leaving enough time for Uncle Henry and Aunt Em to observe the scenery. They come across the Royal Athletic College of Oz, and decide to stop and pay a visit to the Wogglebug. Upon their arrival, they discuss the Wogglebug's teaching methods. The professor leads his visitors behind the college where several hundred youths are indulging in athletic activities. When Dorothy asks when they study other subjects, the Wogglebug is confused, stating that students take doses of their academic subjects every night and morning. He reveals that the wizard invented school pills that have been very effective. He then takes them to a room filled with bottles of pills labeled with subjects like algebra, geography, Latin, grammar, and spelling. Each pill is equal to four hours of study, allowing the students more time to practice their athletics. After they bid the Wogglebug goodbye, they continue their journey, stopping at a farmhouse around noon for lunch. Eventually, they come to the road that leads to the cut and clips. The road brings them to a large wall, with a small door and a sign reading, Visitors are requested to move slowly and carefully and to avoid coughing or making any breeze or draft. Dorothy recalls that the cut and clips are animated paper dolls, so they decide to proceed carefully. They disembark from the wagon and walk through the door. Dorothy leaves Toto behind, nervous that he might make a breeze if he's let inside. When everyone enters, they see a line of paper soldiers with paper guns. They let the door swing closed behind them, which creates a breeze that knocks over all the soldiers. The wizard apologizes for being so careless, and Dorothy helps them back on their feet. Dorothy shows the cut and clips her letter from Ozma. A soldier blows a whistle, and the captain of this army appears. His appearance makes Dorothy laugh, which nearly blows him over. Dorothy asks if they can see Miss Cuttenclip, and they agree to show the visitors to her. Being careful not to make another breeze, they slowly follow the captain past paper trees, cardboard houses, and paper water pumps. 
the captain tells the visitors that Miss Cut and Clip is their queen, who has made each and every one of their people. Eventually, they arrive at the queen's wooden house, and a little girl welcomes them inside. The travelers are surprised to learn that Miss Cut and Clip is a human, as opposed to being a paper doll. They are brought into the queen's workroom filled with paper, paints, brushes, and scissors. She talks about how the first dolls she made weren't alive, but many years ago, she used to live near Glinda's castle. Glinda saw her dolls and took a liking to them, to which Miss Cut and Clip responded that she wished her dolls were alive. So, Glinda brought her magic paper that brought her dolls to life. Of course, the hardships of being a paper person were not anticipated. So Glinda built this enclosure surrounding the area so the Cut and Clips could live peacefully without risk of breezes or rain. While Miss Cut and Clip remains in the village, she won't grow old either. The Queen gives everyone a tour of the village, which is cut short by the Shaggy Man's sneeze. Dozens of dolls are blown over and Dorothy helps Miss Cut and Clip rescue her people. To prevent any further disruptions, everyone decides to leave the village of the Cut and Clips, but there are no hard feelings and Miss Cut and Clip hopes they will return in the future. General Guff leaves the country of the Growlywogs, passing over the Ripple Lands again, and then making his way to the Mountain of Fantastico. On this mountain lives dangerous, shape-shifting creatures called Phanphasms, which are feared by most creatures. But Guff remains unafraid. When he's one-third of the way up the mountain, he comes across a gully filled with molten lava, which he crosses using a narrow bridge. Halfway across the bridge, a scarlet alligator is laying there, blocking the way. He distracts the creature by calling his attention elsewhere, and while the alligator is turned, Guff leaps over the creature, landing safely on the other side. The alligator is not deterred by this, for he is certain the first and foremost Phanphasm will properly take care of the intruder. Further up the mountain, a hairy man with the head of an owl appears before General Guff. He announces that the first and foremost will punish him, and threatens to harm Guff if the gnome tries to escape. The guard leads Guff up the mountain, bringing him to a large stone dwelling. Out of the entrance leaps the first and foremost, taking the form of another hairy man with the head of a bear. The first and foremost swings a brass hoop around Guff's neck and drags him into the stone hut. General Guff explains the plot of the Gnome King, and that they will be accompanied by the Whimsies and the Growlywogs. The first and foremost laughs, and drags Guff out of the hut yet again, planning to intimidate him by shapeshifting. Before Guff's eyes, all of the Phanphasms transform into beautiful women, packs of wolves, lizards, large butterflies, and ultimately back to their original appearances. The first and foremost demands to know what else can be offered to the Phanphasms. General Guff hesitates, before explaining that they will experience the joy of making the happy unhappy. The first and foremost then announces the Phanphasms will aid in the Gnome King's quest once the tunnel is complete. After General Guff leaves, the first and foremost addresses the Phanphasms. With universal approval from his people, he says that they'll destroy the Land of Oz using the Gnome King's tunnel. When that's complete, they will then destroy the Whimsies, the Growlywogs, and the Gnomes before conquering the rest of the world. Dorothy and her friends find their way back onto the main road, and the next day, they come to the road that leads to Fuddlecumjig. Nobody knows what the Fuddles are like, but the wizard knows they're the most peculiar people in all of Oz. Soon after this, they find a kangaroo crying by the roadside. The kangaroo tells Dorothy that she's lost her mittens, which were knitted for her by one of the Fuddles by the name of Grandmother Knit. After learning that the kangaroo lives only two miles beyond Fuddlecumjig, Dorothy invites her to travel with them. The kangaroo tells them more about the Fuddles, who are made up of many small pieces that fit together like puzzles. However, when they get startled, they fall apart and scatter, so someone else has to put them back together. Aunt Emma complains about having to deal with people of this nature, but Dorothy is hungry and hopes that the Fuddles will be able to feed them. They arrive at Fuddlecumjig and decide to enter softly, as not to startle the Fuddles. The kangaroo hops home after the travelers agree to tell Grandmother Knit to make a new set of mittens for her. While approaching the nearest house, Toto starts barking at a beetle. What follows is the sound of several objects hitting the floors of the houses. Everyone enters the nearest house and finds all of the residents in pieces scattered all over the floor. Everyone scrambles to gather some pieces together and eventually they are able to form the head of a man. Once the man's mouth is in place, he announces that he is the cook, which Dorothy is glad to hear. The man helps them find the rest of his pieces and then he agrees to prepare dinner for the visitors. He also tells them to assemble the other Fuddles, starting with the Lord High Chicklewitz, otherwise known as Larry. 
Within the hour, they finish putting Larry together and start working on Grandmother Knit. Once she is assembled, she is informed of the kangaroo's woes, so she gets to work on a new pair of mittens. The cook treats everyone to a lovely dinner, and then the guests go into the yard to match several other people together. After a few hours, the wizard recommends that they resume their journey. Dorothy doesn't want to leave the Fuddles behind in their scattered state, but Larry assures her that they are visited every day by people who volunteer to put them together. General Guff returns to the Gnome King and announces that they will be joined by the Whimsies, the Growlywogs, and the Fanfasms, and also lays out what their respective demands are. The King is astonished by Guff's accomplishments, but very concerned that the Fanfasms in particular will prove dangerous to the Gnomes as well. Guff eases the King's mind, and says that the creatures will report to the Gnome King when the tunnel is completed. With the knowledge that there are now hundreds of chickens in Oz, and therefore hundreds of eggs, they decide to send the rest of their allies first to destroy the land. Then, they will capture Ozma and Dorothy and transform them into ornaments in the king's ornament room. The king also announces that the tunnel will be ready in three days. Before I move on, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to all of you about Anchor. Anchor is a free and easy-to-use podcast creator that allows you to record and edit your own podcast from your phone or your computer. They will also distribute your podcast, making it accessible on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other platforms. Again, it is totally free. In fact, you can actually make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. Anchor is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I am thrilled to announce that the wonderful Recap of Oz will now be hosted by The Oz Connection, the official YouTube channel for OzCon International. The Oz Connection is your place to watch and listen to diverse Oz content produced by Oz fans for Oz fans. From the famous 40 Oz books to MGM's The Wizard of Oz, Disney's Return to Oz, and so much more. So be sure to like and subscribe to receive regular updates from The Oz Connection. OzCon was established in 1964 and now occurs annually on the West Coast. For more information, you can visit OzConInternational.com. The next stop on the trip Ozma had planned is to see the rigmaroles. Belina and Aunt Em debate the proper ways to take care of chickens until the path they're following comes to an end. They decide to cross a meadow, but it's dusk by the time they reach the trees. The wizard decides that they should camp out in the meadow and find their way to the rigmaroles in the morning. The wizard asks for a couple of handkerchiefs, which are supplied by himself, Aunt M, and the Shaggy Man. The wizard places them on the grass and transforms them into three luxurious tents, one for the men, one for the women, and one to use as a dining hall. Dorothy is shocked at the wizard's ability to do this, only knowing him as a humbug wizard, but the wizard reveals that Glinda the Good has been teaching him some sorcery so that he can be a more honest and clever wizard. The men grab some pails and fetch water from the forest while Dorothy cooks stew in the wizard's magic kettle. After they enjoy a large supper, the dishes clean themselves. Later that night, they're sitting in a circle and sharing stories when a zebra comes out of the forest. He hopes that the visitors can settle a dispute between him and a soft-shell crab. Dorothy agrees on behalf of her family and friends, so the zebra fetches the crab. The zebra insists that there is more land than water in the world, while the crab believes otherwise. The humans explain that there is much more to the world outside of Oz, and, much to the zebra's dismay, the majority of the earth is made of water. The zebra is so ashamed that he declares he will never again drink from the pool where the crab lives. With this, the two of them trot back into the forest. The next morning, Dorothy and Belina are the first of the party to wake up. Dorothy is hungry, so she decides to explore the forest looking for food. Belina and Toto accompany her, but she's unable to find a path. After a while, Dorothy becomes lost and can't find her way back. Suddenly, a voice tells them to halt. They all become surrounded by dozens of spoons. The Spoon Brigade decides to hold Dorothy, Toto, and Belina prisoner and take them to the monarch of Utensia named King Cleaver. Dorothy finds it funny to have been captured by a bunch of spoons, and isn't concerned by their threats to kill her if she doesn't comply. The brigade marches their prisoners to a clearing in the forest, 
which is where the kingdom of Utensia lies. The buildings are made of ovens, grills, and cabinets, while the people are various utensils such as pans, kettles, forks, knives, colanders, rolling pins, and several other kitchen utensils. They bring Dorothy before King Cleaver, and they announce their sole reason for doing this is to create excitement in Utensia. What follows is about six pages worth of food and kitchen-related puns, which are well worth the read. Long story short, they realize that Dorothy, Toto, and Belina haven't done anything wrong, so they're released. They wander through the woods, trying to find their way back to the camp. They arrive at a path that splits into two roads. Signs read that one road goes to Bunbury, while the other road goes to Bunnyberry. Dorothy, desperately in need of breakfast, opts to travel to Bunbury with the hopes of finding food. Bunbury has houses made entirely out of crackers, breadsticks, and wafers, and all of its citizens are made of buns, bread, and baked goods of all kinds. When the people of Bunbury notice the strangers, many of them flee into their homes. Dorothy publicly addresses them, announcing that they're lost and hungry. She hopes that they are able to spare something besides people for her to eat. There is some pushback from the community, but after enduring more food-related puns, she is offered a fence made of waffles, a wheelbarrow made of cookies, and a piano made of shortcake. Dorothy thanks everyone for their hospitality, but she's interrupted by a scream. Turns out Toto can't control himself, so he ate three crumpets and a salt-rising biscuit. Belina also happens to peck the eyes out of a raisin bun. Dorothy tries to defend her pets because they don't have the self-control that humans do. The pastries threaten to bake Dorothy, Toto, and Belina in their ovens if they don't leave, and they are ultimately chased out of Bunbury. While her friends are on their journey, Ozma contemplates what occupations to assign to Henry and M. She decides to make Uncle Henry the keeper of the jewels, but she has to think of something for Aunt M to do. While thinking this over, Ozma looks into her magic picture. She's reminded of her first adventure with Dorothy when they took the Gnome King's magic belt. Out of curiosity, she decides to see what has become of the Gnome King. In her picture, she sees the Gnome King working on his tunnel, and she realizes it is being built in the direction of the Emerald City. She recognizes that it must be a revenge plot, but she dismisses it from her mind. She then wonders if Aunt M would be happy to be the royal mender of the stockings of the ruler of Oz. After being excommunicated from Bunbury, Dorothy decides to explore the other road to Bunnyberry. The road leads to a high wall of solid marble with a very small opening. She rings a doorbell and the window opens, revealing the face of a white rabbit. The rabbit clearly isn't interested in what Dorothy has to say and is about to deny her entrance before he learns that she has a letter of introduction from Ozma. His attitude changes when he reads the letter and he opens the door. Dorothy is brought into a small room, but the gatekeeper refuses to admit Toto and Belina. Since they're not specified in Ozma's letter, Dorothy is forced to leave her pets behind. The rabbit, known as the Keeper of the Wicket, announces that he must reduce Dorothy's size if she wants to enter the town. As she walks towards the small door into Bunnyberry, Dorothy begins to shrink until she's the same height as the rabbit. Once they pass through the door, Dorothy is astounded by the beauty of Bunnyberry. Even its rabbit people wear beautiful silk and satin clothes. They bow before Princess Dorothy as she makes her way to the royal palace. After encountering a line of rabbit soldiers, they enter the throne room. There they find the rabbit king, laying on his back, blubbering and wailing. The keeper of the wicket calls his attention, so the king wipes his eyes and asks the keeper to serve lunch for him and Dorothy. Dorothy wonders what's upsetting the king, and he responds that he never wanted to be the king at all. He was elected to rule by the people of Bunnyberry, and the law won't allow him to resign. Despite access to luxurious meals and several servants, the king spends their lunch complaining to Dorothy about how miserable he is. He explains how Glinda the Good made the enclosure for their city because she is fond of rabbits. He's rather unhappy because living in luxury is against the nature of rabbits, who burrow in the dirt, hide from danger, and essentially hunt for their own food. Glinda was the one who established laws that prevent him from resigning, so Dorothy offers to talk to Glinda on behalf of the king to ask for a new king to take his place. He is very happy with this offer and decides to entertain her as a thank you. Together they walk through the palace where Dorothy compliments the king's clothes, he is very proud of his clothing and asks Dorothy to request Glinda's permission for the king to keep his wardrobe. Dorothy explains that if he were to return to the forest, he wouldn't need the clothes, but she will happily ask. They walk into a reception hall in the palace and Dorothy finds the chairs to be exquisite. 
The king wishes Dorothy would ask Glinda if he can keep the furniture, but Dorothy isn't sure the chairs would look good in a burrow. They enjoy listening to the royal band of whiskered friskers, made up of nearly 50 pieces, followed by a comedy routine. They watch a military drill, and the king comes to the conclusion that he would no longer have a bodyguard if he resigns his position. They are also entertained by the royal jugglers and the winsome waggish warblers, and the king becomes increasingly sadder at the thought of leaving Bunnyberry behind. When the festivities end, Dorothy bids the king goodbye and promises to speak to Glinda as soon as possible. However, the king decides that Dorothy doesn't need to trouble Glinda at all. After thinking it over, he realizes that the luxuries in Bunnyberry are too much to miss. He also promises to be much happier in the position he's in and to stop whining about his duties. On her way out, the Keeper of the Wicket announces a petition to erect a statue of Dorothy in the public square of Bunnyberry. Upon their exit, Dorothy is glad to find the party of travelers waiting for them at the signpost. The wizard had followed Dorothy and Belina's footsteps to the road to Bunnyberry, and everyone is glad to be reunited. She tells everyone about her adventures in Bunnyberry, Bunbury, and Utensia, and the wizard recommends that they have supper before continuing on their journey to visit the rigmaroles and the flutter budgets. Afterwards, they will visit the Tin Woodman, Jack Pumpkinhead, and the Scarecrow, and then travel back to the Emerald City. The wizard uses his magic to make supper before they camp out for the night again. In the morning, he transforms the tents back into handkerchiefs and enchants the wheels of the wagon to roll in the right direction, so they won't get lost again. As they start off, Dorothy mentions that she wishes they had a blimp so they could see the forest better. She also expects that blimps could bring several new people to the Land of Oz. The wizard doesn't seem thrilled about this idea, and mentions that he'll talk to Ozma about it. After an hour or two, they come across a young boy and ask him if they're in Rigmarole Town. He delivers a very complicated run-on sentence. Aunt Em interrupts him before he can finish complaining about the rigmarole, and everyone quickly learns what the people from rigmarole town are like. Only after hearing a few people talk, everyone is exhausted and decides to quickly push through the village. From then on, Dorothy promises to use only enough words to express what she needs to say. After a few miles, they arrive at Flutter Budget Center, As they approach the valley, a woman screams that they are about to run over her child. They ask where the child is, and she says the child is inside. But, if the child were on the road, their wagon would crush him. Everyone in Flutter Budget Center worries over foolish things and exaggerates their concerns. After dealing with several Flutter Budgets over the top and irrational fears, they decide to quickly pass through this village as well. Soon enough, they cross the border into the country of the Winkies. They pass by several Winky farmhouses before arriving at the Tin Castle. The Tin Woodman graciously receives his guests, despite the fact that Dorothy notices something is troubling her friend. The Tin Woodman tells everyone that two days before, the Scarecrow had moved onto a farm with a newly built mansion. They enjoy lunch and dinner together, wander through the palace grounds, and spend the night in the palace. After breakfast in the morning, Dorothy wants to know where the Scarecrow lives so they can visit him. The Tin Woodman says that he'll go with them, for he has to travel to the Emerald City anyway. Dorothy can tell that the Tin Woodman is still anxious, and asks what's going on. The Tin Woodman delivers terrible news that he received from Ozma. The Gnome King has been digging a tunnel to the Emerald City with the intentions of destroying Oz. A fearful and helpless feeling washes over all the Tin Woodman's guests as he explains that Ozma denied his offer to arm his Winkies to defend the country. In fact, Ozma had stated that all the inhabitants of Oz combined are not powerful enough to overthrow the Gnome King and his allies, so she refuses to fight at all. Everyone sets out for the Emerald City, planning to pay a visit to the Scarecrow on the way. They hope the emergency will be solved by the Scarecrow's wise brains, but if not, some of them plan to travel to Kansas and start a new life with Dorothy there. They arrive at the Scarecrow's five-story house, shaped like a large ear of corn and adorned with gold and emeralds. He also has an oat field on his land, so he can grow new oat straw to stuff himself with. The Scarecrow has heard the good news that Dorothy will permanently live in Oz, but the Tin Woodman then tells him the news about the Gnome King. He agrees to travel to the Emerald City with them to talk to Ozma after giving his guests a tour of his mansion. After they leave, they visit Jack Pumpkinhead at the Pumpkin Patch where he lives, and upon hearing the Gnome King's plot, he also travels to the Emerald City with them. When they finally return, Dorothy runs to Ozma in tears. Ozma laughs, revealing that the Gnome King isn't troubling her at all because she hasn't given the matter much thought. 
They all have dinner, and afterwards, Ozma reveals that the tunnel was completed today, and it leads directly to the Forbidden Fountain on the palace grounds. Using the magic picture, everyone watches what the Gnome King is doing at the present time. They watch the leaders of the Gnomes, Whimsies, Growlywogs, and the Fanphasms discussing the best attack plans with their people. They plan to start for the Emerald City at midnight, so they can arrive and attack at daybreak while everyone is sleeping. Ozma finally starts to show some concern, and she's advised by the Tin Woodman and Ombi Ambi to gather an army as quickly as she can. Ozma won't fight, however, because she believes no one has the right to destroy another living creature, no matter how evil they may be. She hopes to find a solution to their problem without having to resort to violence, which seems like a hopeless task. Dorothy suggests using the magic belt to transport everyone to Kansas, but Ozma refuses to desert her people. Many of them assume the worst and come to terms with the fact that they'll become slaves. Ozma announces that she will go to the Forbidden Fountain in the morning to try and reason with her foes. Dorothy asks why it's called the Forbidden Fountain, and Ozma reveals that its water is the most dangerous thing in the Land of Oz. The fountain contains the water of oblivion, and whoever drinks it will forget everything they ever knew, becoming as ignorant as a baby. In the past, Glinda placed the fountain there as a plot to make Oz's wicked king forget all of his wickedness. The Scarecrow comes up with a plan to use the Forbidden Fountain against the gnomes and their allies. He has everyone go to bed while he discusses his idea with Ozma. At midnight, the gnomes, Growlywogs, Fanfasms, and Whimsies take to the tunnel and start off for the Emerald City. While they march, the Gnome King mentions to General Guff that he's nervous their allies may turn against them. Guff had an inkling this may happen, but he isn't concerned. He is certain that the Gnome King can use the magic belt to wish all the other creatures back to their own countries before they have the ability to take over the gnomes. As they near the end of the tunnel, the first and foremost begins to sneeze and cough. He complains about how dusty the tunnel is. The Grand Gallipoot's throat also gets dry. The Chief of the Whimsies is desperate to get some water, and even General Guff and the Gnome King complain about the dust. The dust gets thicker as the tunnel goes on, so they hurry for the Emerald City. The Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, TikTok, and Jack Pumpkinhead don't sleep, so they stay beside the Forbidden Fountain until daybreak. Ozma joins them and announces that the villains are coughing on the dust she used the magic belt to place in the tunnel. Soon they are joined by Dorothy, Uncle Henry, Aunt Em, Toto, Belina, the Wizard, the Shaggy Man, and Ambi Ambi. They anxiously wait for the ground to break near the Forbidden Fountain. Suddenly, the ground crashes open and the first and foremost appears, followed by the Fanfasms. As soon as they see the fountain, they run to it and eagerly drink. Once they do this, they look at Ozma with blank stares, which eventually turn into looks that admire her beauty. The Grand Gallipoot arrives with the Growlywogs and they rush to the fountain as well. They are quickly followed by the Whimsies and their chief as well as the Gnome King and General Guff. Guff pushes the Gnome King aside so he can drink from the fountain, which infuriates the Gnome King. He looks around at the warriors and angrily asks why they aren't attacking the Emerald City. However, all of these terrifying creatures now have the mentalities of little children. Just before the Gnome King has a chance to summon the rest of his army, the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman grab the Gnome King and throw him into the fountain. Water gets into the Gnome King's throat, and soon enough, he also forgets everything he knew. Ozma introduces herself to the Gnome King, and she also tells him to go into the tunnel and have his gnomes march home. He gladly does this as Ambi Ambi fetches the magic belt. Ozma then uses it to wish the Whimsies, Growlywogs, and Fanfasms back to their own countries. In an instant, what is left of the warriors are gone. Everyone is glad with the success of rescuing Oz without having to resort to violence. They are also glad that the creatures have forgotten their wickedness. TikTok, however, is concerned that other enemies will come to Oz someday. Luckily, Ozma has been thinking of ideas to combat this. She intends to cut Oz off from the rest of the world entirely, so no one will ever be able to intrude on their land in the future. Everyone decides to accompany Ozma on a journey to see Glinda the following day to come up with a plan. Later that night, after the gnomes have returned to their kingdom, Ozma uses her magic belt to close their tunnel. The next morning, they travel to see Glinda the Good. Glinda, of course, knew they were coming. Her magic book records everything that happens as it takes place, so she already knows why Ozma and her friends have come to see her. Glinda believes it is unwise to allow any outsiders to communicate with or travel to Oz, 
so she reveals to Ozma that she has already made the country invisible to all eyes except for their own. The charm doesn't affect any Ozites, but those who fly over the country will not see it below. Those who look past the desert will not see Oz in the distance. It will be off of the map entirely, to prevent any further danger. The author then reveals that he has received a note written on a stork's wing that reads, You will never hear anything more about Oz, because we are now cut off forever from all the rest of the world. But Toto and I will always love you and all the other children who love us. Signed, Dorothy Gale. The author then wishes luck to Dorothy and her companions, hoping that they find happiness in their invisible country. That's it. That's the end. There is no more. At least, that's the way it was intended to be. But of course, things change. Baum wrote eight more Oz books, and I will be interested to know how he's going to retcon the definitive ending here. His next book, called The Patchwork Girl of Oz, is exciting for me because I've heard of the title character before, and I know she's a beloved character in the Oz canon. So I'm excited to meet her and find out what she'll contribute to the further installments. This book definitely had a unique feel from the other books. From the beginning, we know who the villain is, and while Baum uses this as a device to create some irony and anxiety within the reader, it's a little choppy jumping back and forth between the Gnome King and Dorothy and Ozma. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, though. It reminds me of some of the more modern fantasy novels I've read, and it also makes this book less linear and more cinematic. It isn't what I was expecting for an Oz book, but it was fun. I will say that the ending is a little anticlimactic, but not dissatisfying. Let me explain. This is the sixth book, and it clearly was framed to be the final Oz book at the time it was published. I was hoping that a build-up from books four and five would lead to a larger culmination of events and consequences, and yes, the Gnome King's return is very sinister, and I was really excited to see him confront the Ozites. Of course, the ending just goes to show that the Ozites are peaceful and good-natured people under a pacifistic ruler, and that's really cool. Of course, with all this build-up, I was initially disappointed that there wasn't an all-out war with some victor, but that didn't last long because it makes a lot more sense for Oz to win without having to resort to violence. In the past, only the villains have been violent, so to end the story with a war clearly would undermine the characteristics of the Ozites. Maybe I've also just been conditioned to think that war is the end-all, be-all for stories like this because a lot of modern fantasies like The Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and Game of Thrones feature elements of this trope. So this was definitely very refreshing to read. But one thing that frustrated me, why didn't Ozma use the magic belt to just undo the work of the gnomes and prevent them from invading Oz in the first place? I feel like it would have been much easier and less risky than just hoping they'll just drink the water of oblivion upon their arrival. The book could have been several chapters shorter if she just used that from the beginning. I know in the many, many years since the Oz books were first published, many people compared them to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, and they're very similar. Both of them focus on young girls who find their way to magical worlds with talking creatures and dangerous villains. I've seen a fair share of fan art online that pairs Dorothy and Alice together as well. So imagine how surprised I was to have a whole two chapters in this book that reminded me a lot of Alice in Wonderland. Dorothy gets lost and stumbles upon a country populated solely by rabbits. The creature who leads her into the town is a well-dressed white rabbit, and upon her entrance, she shrinks. Maybe this is a coincidence, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I do get a lot of Alice vibes from that chapter. I wonder if Baum took some inspiration from Carol. I do have one lingering question that I hope is answered in the future. Why can't Toto talk? Belina the Yellow Hen, Jim the Cab Horse, and Eureka the Kitten all came to Oz from somewhere else, and they gained the ability to speak once they were there. So why doesn't Toto have that ability? Did I miss something? Was that explained in another book? Out of all the other Oz books, this one seems to be the most well-written to me. There are a ton of really good lines in here, but here are some of my favorites. To be angry morning, noon, and night grows monotonous and prevents gaining any other pleasure in life. Said by the Gnome King. An unsuspected enemy is doubly dangerous. The reason most people are bad is because they do not try to be good. The human eye is a fearful weapon. Said by the Cowardly Lion. You have perhaps noticed that every person has some peculiarity. 
What your own peculiarity is, I will not venture to say, but I shall never find fault with you, whatever you do. Said by the Lord High Chicklewitz. Thank you again for listening in. If you have any interest in supporting the podcast, you can visit anchor.fm slash ozrecap. I hope to create some video companions to some of these episodes in the future, and becoming a supporter would help me better create content for my fellow Oz fans. If you are interested in reading the Oz series along with me, all of Baum's novels are in the public domain and available online for free. They're easy to read, and the illustrations alone are so interesting to behold. You are now all members of my Oz book club. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Well, that's all I've got. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at Oz Recap for updates and more Oz content. Until next time, I'm Justin, and this has been the wonderful recap of Oz. Oh, 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 oh,